Hi. I'm Dan Stone. I'm the chair of the Programs and Exhibits Committee of the Jewish Heritage Center. We're very happy to put together tonight's program together with the United Jewish People's Order to celebrate and to, to mark uh, the Jewish community and its, uh, its connection and its, rela its events with the, with the Winnipeg General Strike. As we all know, no need to preach to the converted. The general strike was really very, was very important. Um, there's both a good side and a bad side, I think, to some of the commemorations that have gone on, that they, stra that they, uh, they, they foster a sense of unity, which is really good, but it's, they, miss the, they tend to miss the ethnic element. I'm not sure that, well, I haven't followed this entirely, but I think this is probably the only specifically ethnic-based uh, event here, and it's not to to deny, of course, the the unity that went to, that was so important in the strike. But it's also to to give us a sense of something here in particular. Before I get any further, I'd like to say that we're here courtesy of Treaty One, which brought which was an arrangement, of course, with the Anishinaabe and the Cree and various, group, various other indigenous bands and tribes and nations within uh, the Manitoba region. And of course, this is as well the homeland of the Métis. Now, the Jewish Heritage Center, as some of you know, um, is, has two, two different uh, elements to it. One is Holocaust education. And if you're not familiar with uh, the activities, Afterwards, go down the, on the first floor, on the far side, go down the hallway and take a look at the Holocaust Education Center. We also have programs of lectures and symposia for high school students and many other activities. The other element is the uh, research, publish, publication and organizing programs and exhibits on the history of Jews in Western Canada. Uh, most most, of course, focusing on Manitoba and Winnipeg. Uh, our activities are supported by, uh, among others, the Jewish Federation of Winnipeg, which has provided ongoing support for many years. I think that <clears throat> tonight in the focusing on the Jewish community in the general strike, we have two speakers who um, who are from the local community, intensely involved with, with it, and uh, feel very personally about the, uh, about the general strike and, and its heritage. Uh, the first speaker tonight will be Raza Siskin, whom I think most of you know, but just, in case, just to round it out, Roz is a Winnipegger and a North Ender. Went to the Parrott School and St. John's High School. Uh, after taking a break from studies, she went back as a mature student and became, was the gold medalist at the University of Winnipeg, then an MA in sociology at the University of Manitoba. She taught sociology and was also the executive director of the Manitoba Multicultural Resources Center for a number of years. Community activities, of course, involve heavy involvement in the United Jewish People's Order, of which she served as president for many years. Another major focus has been the Jewish Historical Society, now the Jewish Heritage Center, which she was very active for many years. And in fact, she was the last president of the Jewish Historical Society and in transition, then became the first president of the Jewish Heritage Center. And on a personal note, uh, because I happened to run into Roz at the cashier's desk in the bay, when it was the bay, and she said, what, you know, you have some time on your hands now. Why don't you, why don't you join us at the Jewish, Heritage, the Jewish Historical Society? Did I, did I say that? You did that. I said, sure, that seems like an idea. All sorts of ideas seem good in May that don't seem so good in the next September. That was long enough ago that I, my memory of it is hazy and Roz, Roz's is completely gone. But <laughs> right. Thank you. Is that, that, it was more important to me than it was to her, obviously. And anyway, so that... 
So her activities in the Jewish Historical Society, Jewish Heritage Center, have been tremendously important. Uh, she's been a, published, a publishing scholar. Uh, some of her articles are the, very often cited in, in, new, in all historical works. The Alien and Bolshevik in Our Myths, the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike, 1988. Other articles, <coughs> The Jewish Experience in Winnipeg's North End, 1900 to 1914. Uh, just to cite one more, uh, the Winnipeg Jewish community, its radical elements, 1905 to 1918, and there, there are others. In addition, there has been family and Yiddish scholarship, translation and publication of the Walidarsky family letters uh, in two volumes. The first one came out in 1995, the, la the second one came out last year, is that correct? It takes me a long time. Uh, long letter, yeah. And uh, translator of stories by Jew of Yiddish, from the Yiddish translation of uh, stories by, uh, by Jewish female, Jewish women authors, published in a collection called Arguing with the Storm. So Roz is now, will now tell us about the Jewish community and its connection with the general strike as soon as I manage to adjust uh, the microphone. Uh, is that a good height? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. <clears throat> and thank you, friends, family, and members of the two organizations sponsoring this evening, the Jewish Heritage Center and the United Jewish People's Order, both organizations that I have been intimately involved with for many years. It is also great to share this evening with my good friend, Harriet Seidman. Uh, Harriet, we have a lot of uh, competition out there. Basketball has taken over the world. I know, but look at the crowd. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I want to congratulate her on her recently published book, City on Strike. In so many ways, her book has humanized the general strike, giving it a human face, making us aware of the day-to-day -day hardships on working class families, especially focusing in on the difficulties that children face during that period. My research on, the, on this topic was part of a larger MA thesis that looked at the formation of Winnipeg's Jewish radical element in the first two decades of the last century. The strike was very much part of this history. These, two, these past two months, we have experienced a variety of events commemorating the strike's 100th anniversary, and these events are still ongoing However, one element that is given less attention <clears throat> is an examination, an inside view of the East European immigrant working class communities. Tonight, however, we are dealing only with the Jewish community. How did the strike affect them as a community, as Jewish radicals, as workers? In many ways, as we shall see, they bore the brunt of the viciousness of the strike. By 1919, Winnipeg had grown to be the third largest city in Canada. Between 1901 and 1920, Winnipeg grew from 40,000 to 179,000. Winnipeg's population also dramatically increased. Between 1902 and 1916, 8,058 Jewish migrants, immigrants settled here, and with the expected natural process, there were 445, 4,457 children born during that period. So in total, by 1916, it is estimated that the Jewish community numbered 13,473. In 1919, Winnipeg was a very different place when my dad, Joseph Wolodarski, a Jewish legionnaire during the World War I, returned to Winnipeg in April 15, 1919. 
When he came to Canada in 1913, Joseph, a metal, a metal worker trained in the old country, was more fortunate than other veterans, as his former job was waiting for him at Schifrin's tinsmith shop on Selkirk Avenue. He came home in 1919 to a host of problems, many festering before the war, but obviously exacerbated by the war. Unemployment heightened with returning vets. Many saw the immigrant not only having taken their jobs, but were seen as a source of cheap labor. The economy was undergoing radical change, moving from a wartime economy to peaceful production. The nature of work was changing rapidly, from craft unionism to industrialization to a factory situation, resulting in the demand for coll collective bargaining. A new form of unionism was now needed to meet these new working conditions, and in March of 1919, the one big union was organized. For example, in 1919, union membership had increased from 248,000 to 378,000, with 336 strikes reported across the country. In addition, wages had stagnated during the war with no real gain in workers' buying power, while food prices had seriously increased. Women workers, especially significant in the needle trades, were underpaid and incredibly insecure in their jobs. And then, of course, the Russian Revolution of 1917 became one of the, of the major world events that forever changed the world and put fear into the hearts of the world's ruling classes. This was the beginning of the Red Scare around the world. As a result of all these factors, the seeds of Western radicalism, of which the Jewish movement formed an essential part, became firmly rooted. The unrest in Winnipeg was palpable. By May 1st, the general strike began, and the sympathetic general strike was officially called on May 15th, bringing onto Winnipeg streets more than 30,000 men and women. 12,000 were unorganized. At the outset, my dad was one of the strikers. By 1919, Winnipeg's Jewish radical community had been firmly established. Jewish radicals had arrived as early as 1905, bringing with them their secular radical ideology that had been firmly rooted in the old country. Thereafter, Jewish radical presence became a major social force politically and culturally in Winnipeg's Jewish community. Politically, the Jewish radicals were organized as a Jewish branch of the Social Democratic Party of Canada, the SDPC. In 1915, the Jewish branch in Winnipeg was reported to be one of the strongest branches in Canada. For example, in 1915, the branch held 15 lectures with, with 400 people attending each lecture. We should be so lucky today. <laughs> They were militant unionists, defending workers' rights in every possible way. In 1919, they wholeheartedly supported the general strike, both morally and financially. However, there were no branch members involved in the strike committee, as language barriers were seen as a handicap. In the cultural field, Jewish radicals were organized into the Arbiter Ring organization, the Workmen's Circle. The Arbiter Ring was founded in 1900 in the U U.S. by a group of East European Jews with revolutionary tendencies. In 1905, their slogan was, we fight against sickness, premature death, and capitalism. <laughs> In Winnipeg, 
The Arbiter Ring was organized into three branches to accommodate the three streams of thought within the Jewish radical movement, indicating the ferment amongst radicals at the time. One branch was the revolutionary Marxists, and many of them were the Bundists. The sec another branch, the socialist territorialist, or the Poilu Zion, and the third were the anarchists. Each group had their own followers, their own membership, their own leadership, their own activities, speakers, socials, choirs, drama groups, and early forms of the Yiddish schools. They were all steeped in Yiddish literature of social protest and socialist idealism. They also had an Arbiter Ring Free Loan Association at a time when there were no social networks available. All the Arbiter Ring branches met at the Liberty Temple, which was bought in 1917 at the corner of Pritchard and Salter Street. During the strike, the Liberty Temple became a hub of activity for North End Jews. While each branch had their own leaders, the acknowledged leader and spokesperson for the entire membership was Shloyma Amazov, known also as Moses Almazov. He was a member of the Revolutionary Marxists, a member of the, of the SDPC party, and a member of the Arbiter Ring. Almazov came to Canada in 1913 with his family from the Ukraine. He was known for his fiery oratory, his knowledge of Yiddish history and literature, and often gave lectures on these subjects. In the spring of 1919, he was writing exams to complete his MA thesis at the U of M. While supportive of the strike, he was not involved in any way in the strike committee, but, but conveniently became one of three Jews plus two Ukrainians who were implicated in the East European, as the East European foreigners who were seen as the instigators of the strike. Each branch of the Arbiter Ring worked to advance their own version of a socialist future and the Jewish place within that future. Their common bond was to advance the needs of their class, the working class, and that meant their union solidarity. However, the Winnipeg general strike had taken on another facet beyond that of class. This was, of course, true for all East European immigrant workers. The nativist ethnocentrism of the dominant class had zeroed in on, on the foreigners as the, the aliens, the Bolsheviks, the instigators, and the initiators of the spread of radicalism in Western Canada. According to a report by the Northwest Mounted Police, and I'm quoting, the Jewish element of Winnipeg are taking a very active interest in the strike. Even those who have nothing in common with a labor movement are devoting their time to augmenting this movement, end of quote. There was constant bombardment in the daily Manitoba free press of the foreign element as conspirators, revolutionaries, and the worst element in the land. These large ads appearing in the daily press under the auspices of the Committee of a Thousand were rarely refuted. And as the Israelite press complained in an article of June 20th, 1919, these, these ads, quote, remained as evidence, ready for anyone to use as evidence against the foreigner, and that means, of course, the Jew, end of quote. Though foreigners were accused of fomenting the strike and providing its leadership, the strike committee was essentially dominated by leaders of Anglo-Saxon Protestant background. Only Alderman Abraham Heaps, a British Jew, has been positively identified as a member of the strike committee. Jewish workers as a rank and file, many in the metal industry as my dad was, actively participated in the strike from the very beginning. The Jewish community provided strong moral and financial support to Winnipeg strikers as indicated 
in the Yiddish press. Although it is uncertain how many Jews were involved in the Committee of a Thousand, which was organized the day after the strike was proclaimed, there is little doubt that Jewish elites were actively involved. Within the Jewish community, this class confrontation had almost immediate repercussions. Max Steinkopf, identified by the Yiddish press as a member of the committee, was conservative, a lawyer, an affluent businessman, and a school trustee. The Yiddish press strongly voiced the animosity of the entire Jewish community, not only towards Steinkopf's involvement in the Committee of Thousand. He was accused not only as anti-unionist, but there were, were strong suspicions that his loyalty to capitalism and to his class were greater than his loyalty to the Jewish people. In its earliest manifestations, the strike had clearly brought to the surface the deep-seated prejudices of the dominant society. However, these prejudices gave way to active discrimination when arrested strike leaders were differentiated on the basis of ethnicity rather than on class. Six Anglo-Saxon leaders, Ivans, Russell, Queen, Armstrong, Bray, and Heaps, and he, while Heaps was Jewish, he was not active in Jewish life, and as an alderman was not classified as a foreigner. They were all granted bail within a few days of their arrest, while the foreigners, three Jews, Shloima Almazov, Sam Blumenberg, and F. Karitanov, along with M. Verenchuk and S. Shapelry, both thought to be of Ukrainian descent, were denied similar treatment. These five non-Anglo-Saxons who remained in jail proclaimed a hunger strike. They declared that, and I'm quote, quoting, there is a great injustice being done here in that all English speaking were set free on bail while our only crime is that of being foreigners, as reported in the Israelite press of July the 1st. Jewish members of the, of the um, Social Democratic Party branch were highly critical and vocal of this overt discrimination. They were also highly critical of the Anglo-Saxon strike leaders for not having maintained strike solidarity with their arrested comrades and for having acquiesced to the values defined by the dominant society. Although there is strong evidence of union leaders with strong anti-foreign utterances, for example, see Woodsworth's book, Woodworth's book, Strangers Within Our Midst, a committee of Jewish workers under the SDPC leadership was quickly organized, not only for the release of the arrested, but for financial support from the community, for the community needed to mount a vigorous campaign. The Israelite press of July the 8th reported that many money was pouring in. The committee of Jewish workers quickly protested to the strike committee pointing out that the committee had differentiated between Jew and non-Jew, from the British strike leaders to the foreigners. They argued that workers should not be separated and treated differently. This agitation proved fruitful as the strike committee accepted their demands and worked to free the others. The Yiddish press strongly chastised the Jewish members of the Committee of a Thousand for not having exhibited the same vigilance as exhibited by Jewish radicals. They were censured for being a party to the Rosenkampf that had developed. They compared the vigilance of Jewish workers to the Jews in the Committee of a Thousand. And I'm quoting, if they were unable to influence the committee, then they should have withdrawn. This was not done. They made no protest. This was in the Israelite press of June 20th. The state 
had numerous methods of social control to keep the immigrant compliant. Job insecurity, propaganda, physical violence, in intimidation, arrests, break-ins. Indeed, both the Liberty Temple and the Ukrainian Labor Temple were raided by the police on June 16th and 17th. Uh, the abrogation of civil rights, but perhaps the most intimidating was the fear of deportation. By mid-June, a new amendment to the federal immigration bill provided the means whereby foreigners, even though naturalized Canadians, could be deported. This was uh, reported in the Israelite press of June 20th. Only one of the foreigners, Oscar Chapelroy, was actually deported for some irreg irregularities in his papers. The strike was broken with the events of Bloody Sunday, Saturday on June 21st, 1919. Officially, it ended June 26th. Very quickly, there were numerous heated debates within all factions of the Jewish community, especially within the Jewish branch of the SDPC, analyzing the strike and its results. Almazov, in an interview I had with him in New York later on, recalled that their branch did not see the strike in revolutionary terms. Instead, they argued, the idea of a potential revolution was a product of the capitalist class designed to foment apprehension amongst the middle classes. Others argue it strenuously, and this was uh, Harry Gale from an interview that's here in the Heritage Center. They argued that the strike leaders themselves were ambivalent as to the nature of the strike, and I'm quoting, when they spoke with the bosses, collective bargaining was advanced as the dominant issue However, these same leaders spoke differently at meetings and at parks. Here, their talk was revolutionary, instilling the workers with the highest expectations, ready for big begin happenings. The Israelite press in an editorial was far more cautious, particularly aimed at Jewish hotheads. They summed up the situation in this way, and this was a, in the Israelite press of July the 1st, and I'm quoting, I am not one to scare people or to tell Jews to hide their heads in the sand, but I think restraint is in order. No one has the right to bring pain and suffering to the whole community. A little restraint can avoid this tragedy. Jewish workers and sympathizers should reckon with the present conditions and be very careful with what you say and what you do. When you, as worker, express your dissatisfaction, remember that others will not see you as a worker, but will instead recognize you as the Jew, the alien, the stranger. After 60 days in jail, Almazov appeared before a special immigration commission. His impassioned speech made, and that's quote, a strong impression on the commissioner. He was freed to the relief of the entire Jewish community. The Israelite press devoted a full front page to Is Almazov's speech with a huge headline that read, and I'm quoting, Almazov is free. At the commission hearings, Magistrate Noble warned Almazov that he should conduct himself well in the future. But since Almazov could not make such a commitment, he soon left for New York, where he was hired in 1922 as a writer for the Yiddish socialist paper Morgan Freiheit. In the after aftermath of the strike, Jews of Ward 5, the North End, uh, the North End at that time was divided into two wards, 6 and 5, were not in a hurry to forget their antagonism 
to, uh, to Steinkopf. In the 1920 election for school trustee, Steinkopf was challenged by a newcomer to politics, a woman and a member of the SDPC. Mrs. Rose Alkin surprised the entire Jewish community by not only being elected, but by becoming the first Jewish school trustee in Canada. Eight years later, as Rabbi Arthur Cheel reported in his, in his book, the, Jew, the Jews in Manitoba, when Steinkopf again attempted to run for office, he was again defeated by another relative newcomer to politics, Captain William Tobias. In analyzing the effects of the strike upon the Jewish community, there, is no, there was no doubt that the strike had sharpened attitudes against foreigners and that the government had unlimited power to hound political criminals. Jews felt their place in the Canadian scene was tenuous. However, their resolve to, to change the political landscape was sharpened. In the immediate aftermath of the strike, a provincial investigation that was held from July the 10th to September 16th and was headed by Judge H.A. Robson concluded, and I'm quoting, this, uh, this is his words, the strike was based in a protest against different past war living conditions, including the high cost of living, inadequate wages, and profiteering. In June 29, 1920 elections, 11 labor leaders were elected as MLAs. Three, had, three of these 11 had been jailed. Two of, the, of the, the ones that had been jailed, Heaps and Woodsworth, became um, members of parliament and both later helped establish the CCF and later the NDP. The Communist Party of Canada was organized in May of 1921, and although at that time it was illegal. Some of the members of the Jewish SDPC, the party, were its founding members. John Queen, one of the arrested strike leaders, became the mayor of Winnipeg in seven elections, and in 1938 he beat Traverse, or I think that's how he said, Traverse Sweatman, a member of the Committee of a Thousand. Winnipeg had long memories. To conclude, I was fortunate to meet and interview Shloyma Almazov in May of 1976, when my sister Shirley Chachanov, and I'm happy she's here, and I went to New York to visit our aunt living in Brooklyn. Almazov was, to put it mildly, surprised and astonished that we had come all the way from Winnipeg to meet him. And he was amazed that his role in the Winnipeg general strike was not only remembered, but was the subject of research. Then he was 85 years old, he was very energetic, still writing for the Jewish radical paper. He had a mass of silvery white hair, a twinkle in his eye, and a memory that was amazingly intact. His book in Yiddish, published in 1947, is titled Mit, Mit dem Wort zum Volk, with a word to the masses, and it recounts his visit to, back to Winnipeg and his friends, especially Dr. and Mrs. Victor. In 1946, we learn from the Israelite press that uh, that uh, Almazov came back to, Win to Winnipeg on a national tour, introducing us to the Black Book, the first book uh, that made us aware of the atrocities of the Holocaust. How many people have heard of the Black Book? Yeah, not many. He was the national director of the, of the book committee. I recently learned through Google that Almazov's real name 
was Saul a pearl? And some, I remember some were saying that he was a relative of Birch Pearl. Do you remember the happy gang? <laughs> but he wrote under the name of S. Almazov. And no, Almazov was never the leader of the strike, as depicted in the musical Strike. He died at 90 years of age. Thank you, everybody, for being such an attentive panel. <laughs> I did it. Very, very well. I'm going uh, to have Harriet speak. You have questions afterwards. Okay. Stan has a, has a seat for you if you want. Uh, I'll ask you, thank you very much, Roz, for that wonderful thorough and personal presentation. I'll ask you to hold your questions and comments until we hear from Harriet Zaidman, who has taken a very different approach to this. Uh, Harriet, as, as was mentioned, is an active member of UJPO and has been secretary for a long time. She's also a lifelong Winnipegger, um, <clears throat> points to the family background from Russia like the rest of us, poverty, the family memories, the, the long memories that, that have traced us uh, up to today. Uh, <clears throat> Harriet has, was a teacher librarian for 25 years in the Louis Riel School Division with a special expertise in teaching inquiries, inquiry spill, skills and children's literature, which led her to this writing career in retirement. She was the Outstanding Teacher Librarian of the Year in 2017, uh, a, an award from the Manitoba Teacher Librarian Association. In retirement, she writes book reviews and children's book reviews for various, uh, for various publications, and three books, which are over there, uh, and you can get them afterwards. Sherman and the Sheep Shape Contest, 2014. Benny's Dream Horse, 2017. And what brings us here today, City on Strike, 20, 2019. Uh, so Harriet will talk, questions and answers for both of them, a, uh, some refreshments afterwards. Thank you, Dan. And I'd like to thank the Jewish Heritage Center and each bowl for inviting me. And um, I'd just like to thank Roz, especially uh, because uh, Roz, this book um, uh, has you know, been very well received and I'm just very uh, gratified by it. I feel validated and all this, but it couldn't have happened without people like Roz sending me straight on Yiddish and all, and all sorts of details. Um, historians like uh, Sharon Riley and Nolan Riley pointing, helping me out, pointing me in the directions. All sorts of other people, uh, the archives, and um, and the great histories that people have written about the strike, and in particular as the as the strike unfolded, you know how it affected people, and um, so that resulted in in this uh, in this book, and so I feel a little um, humble being here because there are people who know a lot more about it in, in fact than I do, but. Um, uh, and also, there are a few people who actually really do know my real history rather than, than, the, fact, than the fiction you're about to hear. <laughs> anyway, that's the novel. Uh, this is just one picture of my family. That's my father's family in 1929. Thank you. Um, my great grandparents, Sam Sittner with the hat, and his wife, Sarah. There's my grandmother on the right, um, Goldie. And uh, my dad is sitting there beside her beside his grandmother. And uh, so there, I don't have to tell you what people experienced as a result of the strike. They, they experienced the extreme poverty. My father described his family as impoverished in the 20s, destitute in the 30s, and all the consequences uh, that um, that kind of uh, social situation has on uh, people. So uh, just like many other people, they could not achieve their potential. Uh, aside from the negative effects, they simply couldn't achieve their potential, and society was at the worst for it because we had people here, you know, <clears throat> my aunt sitting here beside her grandmother was uh, just dreamed of doing something literary. She was uh, loved uh, theater, she loved literature, uh, but uh, was unable to do it because of their financial constraints. My father said he would have been a historian or been a journalist, and he became an electrician, which is not a, you know, not a, which is a fine way to earn a living, but that wasn't where his heart was. He did turn his uh, ambition into doing some great things for the community uh, in Winnipeg and in West Cologne in particular in terms of education. It was always key to him. Um, 
he went back to school as, a, as an adult uh, because he was determined that he was going to have a university education and it took him a long time and a great deal of struggle and I have to say that it was with great uh, pride that he trusted me that 11, at 11 years old I was helping him make sure his uh, essays were structured well and, and uh, I learned a lot from that but uh, I'm very happy that he uh, that he thought well enough of me that um, and, and us you know we, we sort of all chipped in. So here's uh, 1941. My mom and dad, Nellie and Ben, um, on the corner of Flora and Andrews, where they lived. My mother was born in that in the just behind that window there. Um, but finally, World War II gave people hope because suddenly the government needed your life, and so they were going to treat you better. But that made that was a turning point in terms of uh, people working people's lives. They, you know, when they when uh, people came home from World War II, I think the government realized that. Uh, have another uh, general strike situation on their hands, and they didn't want that. Uh, so, uh, and the movement uh, for organization, uh, something's wrong with this. Something's wrong with this. Maybe I'll carry this. Maybe I'll pick this one up. Okay. Uh, the movement for unionization and uh, the uh, social democratic movement, the CCF, had become strong forces. And so as a result, uh, people's situation, whether it was uh, allowance, family allowances, or pensions, or um, you know, a better uh, public health, all these things improved the standard of living and made our lives uh, much better than our parents' lives had been. And this is when I grew up. I do remember when uh, the streetcars went silent. I do remember when the car barns were taken out at Munston and Maine, and, and buses replaced the streetcars. Um, the Tribune, I, I, in my book I use the Free Press because the Free Press archive was more readily available uh, last year until a certain point and suddenly the Tribune uh, became more available online but I used the Free Press and it was also more virulent um, uh, in this, uh, its rhetoric, uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric um, during the strike but apparently the immigrant community uh, took uh, the Tribune. Um, and my father was a Tribune uh, uh, carrier. So that's how we grew up. And the best thing, I think, that one of the greatest things about growing up when I did is that the newspaper was delivered after school. And so after supper, my father got home at 4.30 and at 5 o'clock we had supper and 5 to 20 we were Monday. My parents had tea and uh, read the newspaper at the table. And we were all there, and so when they would read something, then some story would be told about, you know, they say, oh, well, that's remember blah, 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 about um, some person or some, something that had happened. So there's a lot of information that's transferred in those, uh, in those uh, tiny stories. And um, I picked them up. And one of the things I thought I should do when I was six, I thought this was my job, was to learn how to be an adult, because I realized that I wasn't going to be six forever. So I started reading the comics. You know, after supper, I thought I should have the paper, my, you know, uh, a section of the paper over to. So I started to read the comics, and then I would add every several months or something. I added the tiny stories or whatever. You know, I was practicing, and that I think was pretty good. And uh, when I was in grade two, uh, and we were we were a political family. My father was involved in unions. My mother was interested in it. She was active in, as you know, school issues. So, um, so we and they talked all about the stories, and the general strike was only one tiny story that I heard a couple times in my life. But there were issues. They talked about issues that were going on in the world and uh, things that had happened. And um, so, when I was in grade two, um, I just uh, realized that I should do a little more serious reading. My mother used to abandon us for an hour every day um, and take a book and just lie on the couch and read it, probably to save her sanity. And um, so I thought I should do that too. I should read. So when I came home from school, I used to take some chocolate chips and some white bread and go to the uh, living room and I, I wanted to read a book. And uh, of course, not many people, not, I didn't, we didn't have that many books. Uh, everybody was well read in those days because they used the library. But So we had a shelf with some books and I thought this book's gonna take me a long time to read because I'm because <laughs> I'm seven. <laughs> so um, I picked a book off the shelf that I thought I should read. I took this book off the shelf and I finished it. It took me all year, I think. 
and I do remember Charles Darnay, uh, I do remember snippets of the story, I do remember thinking, hmm, should I feel sorry for him or that, the, that the, the mass is there? Wondering, you know, and I did learn to mispronounce some words because I never asked what the real pronoun, I didn't assume that my pronunciation was wrong. And the best thing my mother did was not take the book away and say that's too hard. You know, you should challenge yourself as a reader. And when I got to uh, junior high school, really, there were kids' books, but, you know, there was still a lot of uh, the, an expectation that you would read adult books, right? And so these are two books I read when I was in grade seven. I learned a lot, and my family always had a social conscience. Um, you know, um, like my parents used to say, watch the news because, uh, the, because of the civil rights uh, demonstrations that were taking place in the, in the U.S. Uh, all sorts of other things like that. They they told me to watch the to watch these things. So and these helped uh, these books, you know, at the time, and especially Cry the Blood of Country. I just uh, they they um, helped develop the idea that I should be aware of these things. And so I was always. And I'm proud to say that as I went through life at a university, I took part in all sorts of uh, demonstrations about uh, nuclear uh, warheads that were on uh, cruise missiles in Canada for women's rights, for, um, uh, I, I can't remember the, num the number of things, but I'm very happy to say and proud to say that I was on the right side of history, I think, in, in those cases. And then life moves on and suddenly I had three kids, a husband, three kids and a dog. I knew always that I would, I sort of always had this feeling that I would, well I could not, I would always marry someone who was political and my husband is uh, just as, was always just as interested in the world as I was and he's a journalist and our kids too have um, uh, been quite active in their ways uh, and are quite aware of uh, social issues and uh, are now passing that on to their kids, which is quite heartening. And I became a teacher librarian, and it was uh, a real joy of a job. Like there was just a, I would have been a terrible classroom teacher, but I, I thrived in the library. Promote, I always promoted books on the question, uh, you know, to uh, promote sophisticated vocabulary, advanced kind of thinking, um, social issues. It's just a uh, children's literature is. Um, took off in the, I'd say, the 70s, 80s, and it is really rich and, um, uh, like I say, it was a joy. And on the question of inquiry learning, um, I became quite um, concerned that, um, you know, kids didn't understand the question of validity of information. So that was one of my, the focuses. The focus I had was that children should, A, uh, learn how to gather information, uh, ensure that it's correct information, learn how to verify, and learn how to write, and I, I was, I'm quite happy about that. But I always maintained, I always kept an interest in uh, my Jewish, uh, the immigrant experience, and especially the Jewish immigrant experience, and I, I remember reading this book and thinking, I like the way this fellow structured it. He took um, the issues, work, culture, home, and he gathered all the different uh, people's different um, comments and observations. And so you've got, you've got a whole, um, the whole gamut of uh, people's experiences in a concentrate in chapters, you know, so that it was concentrated and wasn't, it wasn't spread out. I really like that. And so I went and um, my parents, of course, when, when they were growing up, they, they, the whole village had come to Winnipeg, you know, so there was uh, Auntie Sarah, Tante Sura, Cousin Sarah, um, you know, Tante Surka, you know, I could never keep these people straight. And each of them had an equal number of people on each side named Sarah. So I could never keep them straight. So I thought, how am I going to say, do, you know, be able to tell my children this? So I interviewed them. I interviewed my parents and I did it on the on tape on the basis of the way this book was structured. And I did that in 1993 and I have to say that was extremely valuable um, to be able to write the book because I got a sense of how school was, how, how going to the market was and things like that. And then in 2001 I walked them down Selkirk Avenue and I got uh, a couple hours of their uh, reminiscences about what happened here, who lived there, things like this, and which um, at the time I thought I was doing it for my children, um, but I made a few DVDs and gave it to one or two other people, not, not you know, just 
coincidentally. And then I was thinking that they were passing it off to one of other people, and I, was start, I got a few phone calls from people who said that DVD helped them explain to their grandchildren what their lives were like as children. And uh, I had inter I come to the Heritage Center and taken photographs and interspersed them. And so when I put it up on, I put it up on YouTube, it's about half an hour long, I called it Walk Down Selfridge Avenue. And it's this, their stories in their words, which is what they should be. And uh, some of them are pretty darn funny, like uh, my mother's talking about um, the fresh floppy fish that you know, she would carry home and put in the bathtub to, uh, to flop around until they were ready to eat it. Um, uh, the stories about the, uh, the guys who were dressed up in suit suits and uh, you know, uh, having signals <laughs> to, to tell people where the crap game would be held, things like that. Um, and my, my, my dad too, it was just a, like a, a real treat. And it's interesting now when I look at the analytics sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll see some, you know, normally on YouTube people watch something for one minute and you know, that's the way it is. But sometimes you get someone who's in France or you know, some obscure country or Korea once watched the whole thing, watched 35 minutes. Why? Because all roads lead back to Winnipeg, I decided. <laughs> so, but, it was, but I got a lot, I'm so happy I did this, because I got a lot of genuine information from it. This was, you know, the, from the horse's mouth about what life was like in the 20s and 30s, and I verified, and I did all the, you know, I confirmed everything in terms of research about um, what life was like in 1919. Anyway, I like to write. I used to write a, new, um, a newsletter at work. Uh, I used to write. I, I've been doing reviews for children's books forever. Anyway, I decided uh, uh, who was going to uh, write those ridiculous stories that were roaming around my head, if not me. So I started to write uh, children's literature, and uh, those were my first two books. And. Uh, I, you know, I lost fame in that I, uh, you know, I sold a couple hundred. But it was the, um, it was the, the process of getting there. I think I wrote this a hundred times. That one about forty or fifty times. My third one was, um, my third one came from a story from my dad. When I started to write um, stories, and I would take them over. Uh, I would write. I would take Daisy the dog, who was the subject of the first book, and we'd go walk over to their house. I'd take us a uh, manuscript over, and I'd say, you know, show it to my parents. And my dad started to uh, uh, fictionalize his own stories as a result. He had this story about his, their next door neighbor, whose name was Mr. Siegel, uh, who was a baker, and who would come out on a Sunday morning when he when the bakery was closed and say, oh, I'll buy you a horse. I, he had a horse in the back, a dray horse, a delivery horse, but he would promise all the kids horses. Of course, nobody was going to get a horse, though we had the two cents to rub together. But uh, my dad started to uh, fictionalize it, and he, it was quite cute, but it was not right, quite right. Anyway, I took it and uh, turned it into that, and that uh, was, uh, people liked that. I, we made my dad had, I took some elements that my dad had taken. He renamed him Mr. Becker, as in Baker. Um, and uh, Tom Andrich, uh, who unfortunately died last year, was a Winnipegger, uh, who uh, a lovely painter, fabulous painter. He did a lot of research, and he uh, people quite liked the way he illustrated the North End. So, uh, so I retired, and, and my goal was to write a novel. And I had another novel uh, that I had started in November 2017. And um, so I was working on that. And uh, my husband wrote me an email. He was in Halifax at, during the uh, commemoration of the explosion. And he said, you know, people here feel this uh, event quite strongly. He said, you should write a story about the general strike. You can do this. And so I did what any sensible person would do. I said, of course I can write this novel. Oh, of course I can't write a novel. But I'm not going to start it until January 1st, I said. I have no idea why I said that. It's totally ridiculous. But I did. And uh, we were going to New York. So promise made. I had to keep that promise. I took a book with me. I cracked it open on January 1st. And I started to read. And I realized, of course I know this story. And um, then I, then I, you know, had made this promise to myself, so I had to carry it out. And um, I started to research. I gave myself three weeks to research before I would start to flesh out a plot. And 
And um, after about a week and a half, I realized that I should start fleshing that out. I kept reading, reading constantly. But after about three weeks, I wrote one sample chapter and um, a rudimentary outline. And I put, I decided um, I would send it out to publishers, a uh, proposal out to publishers. Has anyone tried to get published here? Okay, it can take, what, 10, 15 years to get published, really. And uh, usually, if you do hear back from a publisher, it's a form letter. And um, often, they, they often say, we'll get back to you in two to three months, and you may or may not hear from them in two or three years. It's just, you know, the way life is. Anyway, so I expected to hear nothing. And, um, but uh, two weeks later, oh, uh, I sent it off to four publishers who I thought would accept the uh, novel, who would be interested, and two weeks later, I got an email. And uh, it was from Peter Carver at Red Deer Press, which is a division of Fitzhenry Whiteside in Toronto. And uh, he said, I like your first chapter, I like the writing, I like the trajectory that you have the characters on. Um, I think this could be a strong story, an important story. And he said, my grandfather was Ralph Connor. Who doesn't know who Ralph Connor was? Be honest. <laughs> uh, Ralph Connor was um, a prominent Canadian novelist between 1900 and the late 1930s. He lived in Winnipeg. His mansion on, I don't know, Eastgate, Eastgate, Middlegate, whatever, is now the University of Manitoba Women's uh, uh, yeah. University of Women's Club, yes. Um, and he was not only a novelist, but he, his real name was Charles Gordon. He was the, a minister at uh, the churches of the Anglo-British elite. So anyway, uh, Peter Carver, as a result, used to come to Winnipeg frequently to see family. And he got Winnipeg's divide, right? A few months later, I actually did hear from another publisher who said, nah, this will never sell. She was, that person was wrong. You have to write. You have to run into the right person at the right moment, you know, in the right mood and things like that. So anyway, so he said, write the novel. So I started to write. He said, have it to me by the end of June. I um, researched and wrote, and I had him. I had it rewritten it, and I had it to him by the middle of April. And uh, the, you know, I mean, I you know, anyway, you know the kind of research you had to do. And I read everything. I just loved the uh, research. Uh, it was just really, um, I mean, it just motivated you. The more you had uh, horrible stuff like this, the more it, the more motivating it was. And quite frankly, so was that. <laughs> but it is motivating because this is a time when the hearts and minds of people and youth are being fought for. And if we don't fight for it on the right on the, uh, okay, on the right side of history, <laughs> then, uh, then bad things can happen. So that's me. I was pretty darn happy when I got that uh, contract. So that's me. Um, and so there's the book. And uh, I'm so uh, appreciative of Red Deer Press. Peter Carver is one of, apparently one of the best editors in Canada. He helped me uh, tremendously to uh, uh, see where I could take the story further, uh, you know, develop the characters further. It was very, uh, a very pleasant, uh, growing experience for me. I really appreciated it. And, um, you know, since I, when I, I uh, when the book was announced, I didn't really talk about it much before, but when the book was announced, I can't tell you the number of people who came up to me, people I had known for ages even, who said, oh, my grandfather, or oh, my uncle, or whoever was involved in the strike. Like, people have it in their, in their family histories. And they were so appreciative. One woman just came up to me and just shook my arm and just said, thank you for telling this story. And that's all she said. Like, I just wondered what was behind that, you know? And um, so um, it, it's just been very, I'm just so glad I did it. There's the launch. I thought, I was hoping maybe I would get 150 people, but I, there were about 250 people there. And I thought I would get about four or five schools asking me to speak. So far, uh, in the last uh, month and a half, I've, uh, seven weeks, I've spoken, this is the 30th presentation I've made. So I, I just can't tell you how appreciative I am of it. 
Um, it's just uh, you know it, uh, an interesting and a very gratifying experience was to go to Kelvin, where they had people in the tower with guns in case the strikers invaded across the bridge. <laughs> and uh, the teachers there did amazing teaching, amazing teaching. They bought copies for all the kids to read in the classes, and the kids know the history. Like it was not just oh I know a detail or two, but they had deep knowledge and understanding of the story. A 14-year-old girl whose heritage is not from the North End, <laughs> to say the least, came up and said she thought she she felt like she was nailing this 18, this 11-year-old immigrant uh, daughter of really impoverished immigrants. And I, whoa! I thought, wow, that's really gratifying. So that leads me to go back to the classroom, and I've been having a great time uh, talking to kids. The, my my the babushka my father gave me is there. Like I take my I take that with. Because uh, we have a wonderfully, uh, just a wonderful country, in, I think now, with all sorts of people. And one of the uh, quotes from the Toronto, from the Winnipeg Telegram at the time, talks about the uh, the mannerisms and the appearance of the immigrants as being disgusting and, and crude, and their morals are, are base and things like this. And uh, so that's the, that's the people sitting inside in, in front of me. You know, they are being described in that way. Uh, they were immigrants then, and if they're immigrants now. And so I showed them my, the babushka my baba gave me, and I said, my baba was not un, uh, unintelligent, she was not stupid. She was a highly intelligent person, she was not crude, and she was not immoral. She just didn't speak English, and she wore, she liked to wear a babushka. And the kids get it, the kids get it, and I hope, and I try to make the link today, and they do get it. And on a personal note, so I'm very uh, appreciative of teachers inviting me. And on a personal note, what was really fun was that uh, all these uh, these five bumpsters, my grandchildren, were here. Three of them live in Toronto. They all baked and helped uh, distribute cookies that day and felt like they were really part of it. So even though some of them are in Toronto, they have a, a stronger connection to us, to Winnipeg, and to their story. This is their story. And their Harriet, would you tell the story of that? Oh, <laughs> my parents lived on Flora and Andrews, and uh, as I was researching, I like uh, just kept you know uh, thinking. I thought Andrews, A. <laughs> J. Andrews, who was the key person uh, in crushing the strike, lived, was was the mayor of Winnipeg in 1897 to 1898. And the street that my mother lived on, right on the corner, was named after A.J. Andrews. If, you know, they named him he had the street name for himself. So, in the north end. In the north end, well, because that's where the city was expanding out, right? So here's the, the whole crew, that the other ones have grown up, so that's them now. And, but you know, uh, in Toga, like it's just um, uh, on a personal note, uh, this is for them, so. I always do this, sorry about that. <laughs> I think there are two, two very similar and very different takes on the Winnipeg Jewish community and the Winnipeg General Strike. Roz, could you come up here again and say, please, if there are any questions or comments for, for either of the, the speakers, please go ahead. Someone passed me a mic before. 
Um, question first to Harriet, um, more of a comment. You were talking about the tribute. My grandfather, rest in peace, was the president of the Union for Telegraphers. He worked for the CN Rail. I don't know, I gather there isn't a Telegraphers Union anymore. But um, he would not read the Tribune because he used to say it was anti labor. Yeah. And he felt quite strong. He, no, he would not read the free press, sorry. Yeah, read that's the right. That's right. Yeah. Right. Now, the question to both of you in your research, um, or experiences in this. Have you heard from anyone whose parents or grandparents or great grandparents were on the committee of a thousand? I do remember when the movie, when the play Straight came out, and the name Ashtown was played, and a granddaughter wrote a letter to the editor saying how what wonderful things the family had done. And that should not be the only thing. Have either of you heard from anyone? No, but when I was in a school yeah. recently, I, I sort of I asked the children. I said, "Does anybody know about uh, their, the general strike?" And so one child put up her hand and said, "My great grandfather was a special." <laughs> and he was shocked. <laughs> so I said, "Oh, okay." Anyway, as I was um, um, talking, and I said, "And there were some specials shot." You know, I said they shot uh, people, and there were some specials shot because they shot each other. Apparently, uh, mistakenly, they, they were so you know they were shooting wildly, and she was a little bit back. But I said, "Sorry, that's the way it happened." You know what can I say? So, no, I'm just, thank you. No, no, no let's go. Thank you. There's a mic coming around. Be gentle, Susan. Be gentle. Anyone else? Well, first, well, congratulations to both of you for your applications. Uh, I'd like to say first uh, that it's not working pretty well. So I gotta... Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I just want to say that Ross and I have been working on the history, mystery, uh, and we now have about 12 hours of my interviewing her, and yet here I am tonight, and she's talking oh, about you. And she's telling me that showing us that she was president or dandid for 12 years. And in our interview, I hardly knew about that. So now we have to do another hour. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd like to just talk briefly about this question of ethnicity and language during the general strike. And the first thing is, you know, having worked on this for many years, uh, there's a problem today in that we look at the Ukrainian labor temple. They have a massive archive that would lead to a wonderful history uh, of their involvement in the general strike. But we don't have that. No one has written that history. And language, as it was said today, is a uh, major barrier, not, not allowing that to, uh, that to happen. And then, uh, uh, there, Sharon and I, just before we published this 100th anniversary edition of the book, of the driving tour, uh, we had a kind of stop in the press because we came across uh, an interview with a woman, uh, a Ukrainian woman, who was uh, born in the Ukraine, came here when she was nine years old, and her mother couldn't afford to keep her at home with her, and so she placed her in a Ukrainian bookstore uh, on Selkirk Street, where she worked for about a year and really didn't like it. Now, this is where it gets very interesting because this woman, Olga, uh, as a 10 year old, then is placed in a Jewish home just up around Burl Street. And she yeah, really wants to learn, she really learned, wants to learn uh, to, to be educated. So the young, there's a young Jewish girl in the family. And she would go off to school, and every day she would come home, and she would sit down and go over her classes with Olga. And this is the way Olga learned and was educated. But even more interesting, and this, I'll come back to this, it's really significant, is while she's there, she learns Yiddish. And she really enjoys her time in this Jewish family. And then she has to leave, and she goes, and she's working the laundry. 1919, she's about 21, 22 years old, she's not political, she becomes involved in the Winnipeg General Strike, she goes to the meetings at Victoria Park, uh, in 
suddenly, you know, she says, she basically says, you know, the, uh, uh, I was awakened to the class struggle, is the term she uses. And while she's at the park, she meets up, she's uh, 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 encouraged to go to the women's labor cafe in uh, where their uh, kitchen for the young women who are, need support. So she makes friends with Helen Armstrong, Catherine Queen, and Edith Hiscott, three of the most important women in Winnipeg in the general strike. Partly what makes that possible is her being able to speak English. After the strike, and this is where it gets even more interesting, after the strike in the 1920s, she gets more involved in the Ukrainian labor temple, and she becomes an activist. But while she's, and she joins the Communist Party. While she's doing this, she's invited by the women at the Liberty Temple to come and meet with them because she speaks Yiddish. <laughs> and when they have to find someone to go to a, the, be part of a delegation in Winnipeg uh, over raising money for uh, the famine in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, uh, the Yiddish women at the uh, uh, Liberty Temple, they asked her to be their representative, this is a Christian woman, to be their representative to this committee because she speaks, you know, because she speaks Yiddish and English, and they didn't feel comfortable enough to, uh, uh, to do that. And then when I was talking to Mr. I was talking to uh, uh, some women at the Labor Temple just a few weeks ago, they were saying that around the Labor Temple, she was seen as an internationalist. Not politically, she was, but, but inter she, she was more, they said she was more international than the other women because she could speak English and she could speak Yiddish. So the complications of the general strike around language and ethnicity and gender are really quite remarkable. And it's frustrating when we work on it. We just don't, we don't, we need the language to get into those sources. And I was thinking of this when mm -hmm. both of you were, were uh, talking. Yeah, I, I don't think the Jewish community ha had animosity toward, um, because of language. They knew that they were handicapped because they didn't have the English language. So that wasn't an issue at the time at all. No, no That didn't become an issue. No, I wasn't implying it was. What I was saying is that it's com yeah. the whole strike is complex because we can't really get inside. There is no one from the Ukrainian community who's done what you have done for the Jewish community. Well, I, That's the frustration trying to write about it. Okay, I, I don't know why there isn't anybody in Ukraine in the labor There's a lot of history there, yeah. a lot of historians as well. Oh, 
there are a lot of pictures of her with with the doll boys as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah
My dad was a, a CN worker, railway worker in uh, Transcona. <clears throat> so he wasn't uh, uh, he wasn't um, working at CN at the time. So I'm not sure about the pensions, but I don't know that they got their pensions. Does anybody know about that? Paul? <coughs> Dismissed workers in the strike, of which there were many, uh, there was no laws as there is today that your pension rates are vested. So uh, I, I know the story of the postal workers who were dismissed. They did not get their pensions. In 1994, on the 75th anniversary of the strike, the community could talk about the strike. No one would talk about this in 1969. Uh, but in my 1994, most of the players are gone. The divisions and families are, are not as raw. A lady sent me a letter uh, uh, about a guy who was 20, 21 years of the fire department. He went on strike in 1919. Uh, 196 out of 205 firefighters went on strike. They were ordered back to work. They started to trickle back. Uh, by the end of the strike on June 26, 1919, there were still about 100 firefighters striking. 52 were dismissed. The chief decided 52 couldn't come back. Five out of six union executives, they couldn't come back. This lady sent me a letter, 1924, a guy is, he used the word begging, he's begging city council to reinstate him for one day that he can access his 21 years of superannuation contributions. The answer from the city was no. Now today, 100 years later, your pension rates are vested, even if you're fired from a job, not take away what you've got vested, but there are undocumented thousands of workers who probably had money invested in very poor pensions of the day that weren't able to access them. I also wanted to make one comment on the Winnipeg Tribune. Uh, two, two things I find amazing in this. In uh, March of 1919, there was a conference in Calgary. Western Canadian trade unionists were frustrated with the majority in Eastern Canada. They wanted to pursue industrial unionism where all workers could be unionized, not just the crafts and the so-called skilled workers. So 235, 236 workers from the four Western provinces met in Calgary. And among other decisions, the, the tentative steps towards the one big union emerged from that conference. The Winnipeg Tribune did not cover the conference. It kind of slagged the workers. They're too militant in Western Canada. And the Labour Council, in late March of 1919, placed a boycott on the Winnipeg Tribune. Winnipeg was three newspapers at that time. The Tribune was so concerned about this, they met with the Labour Council. What can we do to remedy this? Uh, and the, and the uh, Labour Council asked for two things, and the Tribune did both. Print the proceedings of the Calgary Conference, which ran to seven full pages of the broadsheet newspaper. No pictures, no ads, seven pages. The Tribune said, okay, we'll do that. And we want 20,000 copies for you to give us to put in our Western Labor News, which was distributed to 20,000 homes uh, by the Labor Movement. And the Tribune said yes. The astonishing thing to me there is two Number one, that the Tribune shook at their boots at a labor boycott of their paper. And two, that the workers of the day would be, would all be in one day if they couldn't read, somebody would read to them that level of detail. Today, in the multiple 140 character Twitter, Facebook, etc., I'm not sure you could send three paragraphs to the 100,000 trade unionists in Winnipeg today. And I'm not saying people don't read today, but that level of connectedness. They had such a sophisticated communication system in Winnipeg in 1919. Why was it sophisticated? They had their own newspaper. People were asked to be peaceful during the strike. Come to Victoria Park. If you can't get to Victoria Park, go to one of eight parks around Winnipeg. We will explain to you what's going on. So face-to-face, -face, word of mouth, a completely informed citizenry who backed their leadership. Over half the homes in Winnipeg were on strike. No strike date, etc. 
we can learn lots from the trade union movement of 100 years ago about the importance of face-to-face -face contact with the folks. But uh, I believe the OB, the one big union, which was the dream of Russell, it, it died. It was a casualty of the Winnipeg General Strike. And the last thing Bob Russell wanted in 1919, to the extent he was a key player in the strike, the last thing that any of them wanted who were organizing was to have a general strike. But the conditions, the melting pot, it all came together. An explosion of pent-up demand from the war years, substandard housing. You know, over a thousand Winnipeggers died of the Spanish flu uh, pandemic in late 1918. Where did most of them live, do you think? The North End, where there was no uh, plumbing, indoor plumbing, and things like that. And people walking on doors and uh, people not wanting to go to hospitals. So it's a different world today, but ask yourself today are there new Canadians, immigrants, refugees in Canada who are worried about deportation? I believe there are. Is there inequities in our world today on the income scale? I would suggest there are. Are there people with pent up demands who feel they have nowhere to go with their arguments? Yes, there are. And uh, we had much to learn from 1919, in my view. And I think Harriet and Roz, Roz has been home for a long time, and Harriet's book, which I've read, they offer uh, an opportunity, in Harriet's case, for young people to put, to put their own uh, take on this event through the eyes of a young person. And I was most struck, Harriet, when you can comment on this, the young boy makes the momentous decision to deliver the Seattle newspaper, that's a struck newspaper, in order to give pennies to his mother. How many stories in our community 100 years ago existed like that, where people had to maybe do things that they didn't want to do? But in this case, he wanted his mother to have something to make soup. That's all they could have every day. But that character's decision to deliver the newspaper, in my mind, was a momentous decision. Came it came from real life, it came from a, a real story. Yeah. Uh, the Boy from Winnipeg, um, that, that book, like that, that just grabbed me. And he was a newspaper carrier, their family was split on the question of the strike, one parent against, one parent's for. They were completely broke, and he made that decision, and he <coughs> suffered for that decision. He said that he said he the day started to deliver the papers again, he um, didn't know if the how if each house would take the paper, you know, he was very uncertain. So he went to the people's doors and asked them, he called through to one woman whose back was turned, she was washing dishes, and he called through and he said, do you, do you want the free press? And she, in, like in, in a speed that cannot be described, that he described in flash of lightning, uh, hurled herself down the hallway with the basin of hot soapy water and flung it at him through the screen and sold him in no uncertain terms to get the out of there, you know, get that paper out of, that, out of their house. And uh, so he was, you know, but he still was going to do this. So he, he sort of cleaned himself up and not 20 minutes later was walking down the sidewalk and uh, two men uh, who saw him uh, with press bag, the wrap up. So I got the story from there. And it was the real life, it was real the reality of it. The difficult decision tore him apart, but his family was hungry. You know? Yeah. I so Ross, uh, from your quotations it sounded like there was a, a radical or at least progressive Jewish press at the time. Can you Israel, say a little about that? Israelite Press is a very radical paper. <clears throat> Frank um, Simkin was the producer. <clears throat> Sorry. He was one of the, from the anarchist movement. Um, uh, Mark Selchin, I think he later became the um, editor of the paper, was from the, um, uh, the um, what is Zion, the Zionist aspect. But uh, reading the paper gave you a very different impression of what the Jewish community was like as compared to today. I mean, they had um, they had every kind of um, 
experience that you could you could want. They had translations of some of the classics in in the, in the newspaper, lengthy articles of uh, discussion, debates uh, on on different topics. So the paper was quite different, um, and it was heavily supported in the Jewish community. Thank you very much, speakers and audience, and contributors from the audience, uh, for the evening is getting on, so I think we should call an end to it. There are, Harry has books over there for inspection and sale. There's coffee and there's some cookies. I call to your attention uh, a photographic exhibit on the first floor. If you know the display windows, go down the corner, all the way to the end, turn left. The exhibit isn't quite finished, Sam uh, wants to emphasize, but there's a lot of it up there, and you'll see pictures of Rose Alkin, whom, uh, whom Rod's mentioned, and Max Steinkamp, the, the other one, and uh, some absolutely wonderful pictures of radical picnics in the Sinaloi Park, 1906, 1912. Uh, very interesting collection of photographs and some texts. So thank you very much and uh, please enjoy yourselves.